Welcome to the Savings Angel Show. I'm Josh Elledge, the Chief Executive Angel at SavingsAngel.com, podcasting to you from the heart of Gator Country, Orlando, Florida. I'm an extremely busy consumer expert, money-saving advocate, syndicated newspaper columnist, and that guy who turns digital entrepreneurs into media celebrities at UpMyInfluence.com. I love what I do, and I can't wait to get going on today's episode. Now, in order to help you save more, earn more, and live more abundantly on today's show, I'll be covering eight types of apps to help you save money. We're going to talk about how to maximize your 401k with Chris Costello of Bloom.com. We're going to talk about why it's important to be adequately insured with Rich Lunsford of USAA. Listen, I've got lots of great information. I'm here to help you live more abundantly, so let's get going. Are you ready to save more? So let's get started with eight types of apps to help you save money. Now, these days, our whole lives are on our phones, from calendars to social media to music. Smartphones have a lot of uses, and saving money can be one of them. Now, while you may know that apps can save you money, you may not know that there are multiple types of money-saving apps. Now, with so many different apps, you can find ways to save in every aspect of your life. So here are eight types of apps to help you save money. Number one, investment apps. Now, if you want to start saving or investing, all you need to do is download an app to do it for you. Now, some apps like Acorn automatically deduct money from your account and invest it for you. Now, if you're looking for something a little less risky, apps like Digit automatically take money out of your account and deposit it into a low-yield savings account. Now, which method you choose all depends on what your financial goals are. Now, anyone with a 401k or other retirement plan needs to check out the health of their investments through Bloom. And now that it's Bloom with three O's. Bloom can give you a free analysis of your plan within five minutes. And I'm actually going to be talking with Chris Costello from Bloom in just a little bit so you can hear and understand a little bit more about how Bloom can make your life more awesome. Now, getting your portfolio right can have a significant impact on long-term growth that could make thousands of dollars difference at retirement time. That's why I'm here. I'm here to help. Now, you keep your plan right where it is, and the analysis, like you can get from Bloom, will tell you if you have the right balance between stocks and bonds and much more. Now, the second type of app that I want you to be using are bill negotiators. Now, if you have a nagging feeling that you're paying too much for your internet or another utility, but you're not confident in your negotiating skills, bill negotiator apps can help. Now, upload your bills into an app like Bill Shark and let them negotiate better rates for you. It's worth a try. What could it hurt? Number three, budgeting. Now, budgeting apps help you save money by keeping track of your expenses and helping you avoid overspending. Now, some budgeting apps allow you to connect your bank account so that they can track your expenses effortlessly. Now, if you're not comfortable with that, you can find an app that allows you to input your expenses and income manually. It takes a little more work, but it can be more secure. Number four, earning points. Now, you can find a variety of apps that give you points for performing different tasks. Some apps give you points for scanning items in a store or even just for walking in specific stores with your phone. Now, apps like Swagbucks, which you hear me talk about a lot because it's such an easy, no-brainer way to save free money that you're not even getting. Okay, They give you points for watching videos, playing games, or taking surveys. Now, these points can be redeemed for a variety of gift cards, and some apps even allow you to redeem your points for cash. Number five, coupons. Now, coupon apps come in a couple varieties. Now, some offer general manufacturer coupons that you can use at any store. Other apps are store-specific, like the Target app that covers Target-exclusive coupons. Now, the best part about coupon apps is that you don't have to go through all the trouble of clipping paper coupons and organizing them. They're all right there on your phone. Swagbucks in particular is a fairly unique player in this world. It allows you additional savings beyond any manufacturer or store coupons you can use. Talk about triple dipping your savings. And number six, 
rebates. Now, certain apps offer rebates on specific types of items. Apps like Ibotta, which you can go to at savingsangel.com slash I, B as in boy, O, T, T, A. Go there. And what they're going to do is they're going to give you, again, free money. It's rebates on groceries and other household items. Just log into the app to check out what kind of rebates are available. Then when you've purchased a qualifying item, upload your receipt to receive money back. Now, usually the receipt or the rebates come back to you in the form of a PayPal payment. Now, some apps do have a required minimum balance before they will transfer the cash to your account, but these minimums are usually not hard to meet if you use the app frequently. Number seven, career-specific money-saving apps. Now, you can download an app that's made specifically for your career or lifestyle to show nearby places that offer discounts or deals based on your status. For instance, Military Cost Cutters is an app that lists establishments that offer military discounts. Campus Special shows deals and savings for college students. Now, if you have special circumstances like this, there may be an app to help you save money. So check it out. Finally, number eight, price tracker apps. Now, some apps help you out by showing you the best deals in your area, wherever you happen to be. Now, Gas Buddy shows the prices of gasoline at all the nearest gas stations. Now, this is especially useful when you're traveling. Best Parking shows you a map of inexpensive places to park near your current location. Man, I could have just used this when we went to Savannah, Georgia during... Um, uh, gosh, what, what holiday was that? Uh, the, you know, the, the Shamrock holiday. Yes, uh, St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we ended up paying, uh, it was like $35 for an hour and a half of parking. Ooh, man. Anyway, this can be a great money-saving tool. Again, the name of the app is called Best Parking. Check it out, uh, particularly if you're in an unfamiliar city. So there you go. There's eight different types of apps. If you don't have them on your phone right now, maybe review what I just went through. Of course, you can go to savingsangel.com. You can scroll back. I'm referencing a lot, all of these from a blog article that we created on this. So go through, add some new apps to your phone, and start saving some more money. <laughs> Now, saving money with apps is easy, but let's talk about how you can use those savings to maximize your 401k. So with that, I'd like to invite Chris Costello from Bloom with 3 O's.com. And back with us is Chris Costello, who is one of the founders of Bloom. And Chris, we had such a great conversation last week, and I wanted to continue it uh, just in terms of helping consumers understand how management of 401ks work. And I really want to chat about where hidden fees are and, and how that all works. Well, Josh, I think you're being polite when you said that we had such a great conversation. That was actually code for, man, Chris, you talked for a long time last week. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't going to say that this time. He was doing stuff. I'm like, <laughs> Chris, obviously, what I love is that you have a lot of passion for this subject. Yes, I am the co-founder of this company, and I get it's 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 I get to do a lot of neat things in that role. But one of like literally the my the things I enjoy most in my life is talking about the reason behind why we started Bloom, this problem that we're solving and just kind of helping people make better financial decisions in general. Like I, if I had a platform where I could just do that all day long, I'd be, I'd be really, really happy. So thank you for giving me a platform today. Okay. So without getting too down in the weeds, can you kind of talk about uh, like what management is? It's funny because when we, when we were first building Bloom, we were trying to think about like, how do we convey the message of what we're doing? And we struggled precisely with the word management. Like, what does that really mean? Okay, you're a management 401k, but sometimes we take that for granted that maybe not everybody knows exactly what that means. So if your listeners right now, if they have a 401k, if they've had a 401k or a 403b, they will remember at some point, uh, maybe when they first signed up, they were given either something electronically where they went online or there, it might have been a packet of paperwork. And they were given a menu or a choice of funds that they could direct their money into. It's, it's critical to, to point out your employer is not doing this for you. 
The employers used to do this back like when my grandpa was working as a pilot for TWA in the 60s and early 70s. He had a pension. Very few people today have a pension. My, my good friend who's a police officer, my other good friend who's a, who's a teacher, they're thankfully going to get pensions. But the rest of us, if you're in corporate America, very good chance you're not going to get a pension. But in those days, the employer, if you had one of those, the employer was oftentimes handling it for you. Today, though, with the 401k and the 403b, the employer is just making this thing available to you. And the employer is involved in, likely with a consultant or an advisor or broker, they're selecting some menu of fund choices that you have to pick. Sometimes that menu of funds that you're supposed to pick has a, a total of maybe 20 different options. We've seen some really crappy plans that have like 150 options to pick from, which is not doing anybody any good whatsoever when you've got that many choices. But my point is, inside your retirement account through your employer, you've got a list of choices you have to pick from, okay? If you're doing it yourself, that's something that you have to go in and kind of make guesses yourself. Kind of back to my story earlier, when I'd see my friend's 401k, that's where I could see they had kind of just a hodgepodge. Like it just, there was no rhyme or reason, uh, no, no good diversification or no good balance between stocks and bonds. But the act or, or the process of managing basically means that you are going to hire Bloom, if you so choose, to manage that for you, which means we will go into your 401k, our technology will, it will look at your entire fund menu of options, whether you have 20 to pick from or 200. Our technology will review every single one of those. And then our technology will build an appropriate allocation for you and put it in place for you, meaning make the transactions for you. So this is not a service that's going to send you an email prompting you with advice. We are doing this for our clients. So if we need to completely change the mix of investments you've got currently, because it's kind of a mess, we, our technology does that through automation for you. And the, basically the three things that we're doing uh, specifically in terms of managing your account is number one, we are making sure that you have an appropriate mix of stocks versus bonds inside of your account. This is critical. This is probably the most important thing. So if you're a younger person, if you're 30 and you've got maybe three decades to go before you're going to need this money, you should not have 50% of your portfolio in bonds or uninvested in a money market. Conversely, if you're on the doorstep of retirement, you probably shouldn't have 100% of your portfolio in stocks. There's some appropriate mix given your time horizon to retirement. We've got a pretty good idea. There's no one right answer, but we've got a pretty good idea what that stock to bond mix should be given your time horizon to retirement. And that's something that you tell us when you're going through that kind of that free analysis process. You, you tell us your date of birth and you tell us when you'd like to smash your alarm clock for good. And so then we know uh, how much time frame we have to invest that money. So number one, we are making sure that you have the appropriate mix of stocks versus bonds given your time horizon to retirement. Number two, we're making sure you have an appropriate amount of diversification. Simply stated, we just want to make sure you don't have too many eggs in too few baskets. And then the third thing is we are doing a fee analysis. So we're going to look at what you're paying in hidden fees right now. And we can tell you if we think we can lower those hidden fees, because I'm telling you, the funds inside of, uh, of your 401k, they're not created equal. And there is a big disparity between the internal hidden fees of some funds and the others. Massive difference, like huge difference sometimes. It's kind of crazy to think that there could be that big of a difference in terms of the fee structure of these investments inside of your one single 401k. But we, we've been doing this long enough and we've gathered enough data now, Josh. We have calculated that on average, on the average client at Bloom today, over between the time they signed up for Bloom and when they will retire, on average, they're on pace to save over $40,000 of hidden fees just because they signed up for Bloom and we went in and we knew how to find the, the funds and the plan that had lower cost structures. That's 41000 of your money, not the company's money, not the fund's money, of your money. That's 41000 of extra dollars that would be in your account at retirement.
when you share something like that, I'm skeptical. Like, how can that, how can those fees be that huge? In isolation, you look at them, and I think this is where, this is kind of, this is part of the uh, the benefit that Wall Street has had, is you look at these fees and you're like, what's the difference between 1.2% and 0.5%? That doesn't seem like a big difference. You know, we're talking like less than 1% difference. But when you take that, for somebody who's in their 30s, and you start to compound that, not just today, because you might have you know ten grand or thirty grand in your four hundred one k today, or forty five grand today, but you're not going to have that over the years in which you're investing. That account should be obviously should be growing. So if you think about additional contributions, if you think about the time, if you think about compound interest, there's actually cases, Josh, where the savings is in like way more than that. I'm just quoting you kind of the median savings of about forty one thousand dollars. Clearly, there are some cases um, where people out there are already in really low cost. You know, Vanguard has a really good low cost 401k platform. And oftentimes with our Vanguard clients, there's not a huge difference in fee savings. So in those, I mean, in those cases, yes, fee savings is important, but fee savings isn't going to matter if you've completely botched your 401k fund allocation. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, I think, I think we, we, t- we tend to get wrapped up in fee savings a lot and it's kind of a, a kind of an eye catching headline grabbing. You know, I remember a couple of years ago when, when, uh, before, uh, Obama left office, he was talking about, you know, there were, I think they're quoting like some, some number like $15 billion a year that people were paying in, in fees inside of, yeah, yeah. And, and that, that's true. Um, and, and fees are definitely, Definitely, it's, it's definitely you know something that we are very cognizant of trying to minimize for our clients. But there's actually more, even more important things in your 401k than fees. You know, getting your allocation right, um, not making bad decisions. Once we tell our clients all the time, "Hey, listen, we're going to put you in a great allocation that's appropriate for your for your age. We're going to root out as much fees as we can." But if we put you in this great allocation and minimize your fees, and then the first time the market takes a dip, you bail out, all that good work we've done goes out the window completely. Most Americans actually hurt themselves way more, not because they're paying too much in fees, not even because they've got the wrong funds in their 401k. It's because their behavior is terrible. Left to their own devices, people panic out. They sell when the stock market goes down. They chase when investments are going high. You know, they have the water cooler discussion that we talk about where you're at the water cooler at work and somebody, you know, your coworker says, I made 52% in the commodities fund inside of our 401k last year. And then you're like, oh, wow, I didn't make that kind of return. You walk back to your desk and then you put some money into that commodities fund. Well, the commodities fund did well last year. You know, this year it might suck. Uh, those types of kind of uh, knee-jerk, emotional investor behavior questions is actually the cause of more wealth deterioration for average investors than anything else. But but I, I digress. Now, I thought that they had changed the laws. And again, I, I, I'm kind of a layman. I, I'll be honest. I like I, I feel a little savvy, but I'm still, you know, just here like re- remembering the news. It was a handful of years that when this was an issue, you'd brought it up, that I thought that they changed the laws so that things would be much more transparent for consumers. You're right. There's, <laughs> what you're remembering accurately is fee disclosure. I know exactly what that is. I'm a 401k participant myself and my company's 401k, and I get that document. And, and Josh, I am uh, a 22-year veteran in the financial services industry with my CFP, Okay been doing this for my entire adult life. I get those fee disclosures. I can't even hardly understand them. Okay. And it's not easy to find like where the fees are. The fees are called different things. You may be paying these. You may not be paying these. I mean, it almost requires a PhD in finance and like a a PhD. What do they call it? What's a project you have to do before you get your master's or your PhD, your, 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 yeah, your dissertation or thesis. It almost requires you doing one of those to, to, to really get a sense of what you're paying accurately inside of these things. And so that's part of the reason like we wanted to make that part of Bloom is we wanted to be able to build the technology that could decipher that. So instead of you doing a PhD project, just go to Bloom, take four minutes, it's free, and we can give you a pretty dang, darn good idea of what you're paying in hidden fees right now. 
And um, I, I think simplicity and just making it very, very easy to understand. Um, is Bloom, can Bloom say, hey, wait a minute, you're paying these fees. Um, I just want to let you know that's a little high for what we normally see. Is that the kind of information I can get? Totally not. But now keep in mind, keep in mind. So there's we, if you're still working at your employer, okay, you don't have the ability. We, we actually had a client one time say this, that we actually have borrowed this quote because it's phenomenal. We had a client one time message us and he says, you can pick your friends, you can pick your spouse, but you can't pick your 401k provider, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is true. Unless you're the head of HR uh, you're the, or you're the head of benefits at your company, then you can. But if you're, you're an employee, then you don't get to pick who your 401k provider is. You're going to get, you're going to get, you know, that decision to be made for you. Then you're going to be given that menu of, of funds. And so you don't have tons of choice, but here, here's an example of something that will illustrate the things that can be done inside of your 401k. Let's say you happen to have four different fund options, investment choices that will get you access to us large company stocks. Um, and three of those are F- Fidelity Growth Fund, Fidelity Blue Chip Fund, Fidelity some, something else, Contra Fund. I'm just kind of making up some names right now. And then the fourth choice is the Fidelity S&P 500 Index Fund. Um, all four of those are investing in large company stocks. Three of those funds might be charging close to 1% a year of hidden internal expenses, but that index fund might only be charging one-tenth of 1%. So literally one-tenth the cost. And so if your 401k, and we'll know this, Bloom will know this, offers a decent selection of these index funds, that's when we can really make hay. Because if you happen to have selected a, you know, a bulk of the traditional actively managed funds that carry, tend to carry higher internal expense ratios, then we will absolutely, our technology and our algorithm is programmed to root out and find the lowest cost fund for each asset, asset class. And then that's the one, those ones that we put into our clients' portfolios. And so that's how precisely we can make this kind of difference for our clients when we're talking about fees. Amazing. Amazing. We've got a blog article that that really kind of spells out. We we went through and kind of reviewed Bloom and and um, so you know to the person who's listening to this conversation, I, I think you have probably now you're woke. <laughs> you have an awareness um, in in terms of what's going on right now, the money that you're potentially losing. And so, what I'd love for you to do is, you know, your loved one, your spouse, you know, whoever else needs access to this information, certainly could share this conversation with them um, and take a look at Bloom. What I'd recommend is that if you could take a look at Savings Angel, we, we've kind of taken a lot of what Chris has just shared here and, and kind of written this all out for you um, so that it's pretty easy to digest. And then, of course, you know, we'd love to introduce you to Bloom. And, and, uh, and Chris, I should say we do have an affiliate relationship. So this is a mission for me. You know, anytime that consumers can have more awareness uh, and more just clarity on what's going on with their uh, spending and uh, where their money is going. I, I'm such a fan. And so when I learned about what Bloom does, uh, I, I mean, this is just uh, absolutely great. Go to savingsangel.com. And then on the right-hand side, just scroll down and you'll see a, uh, a big image that talks about managing your 401k uh, discovering fees uh, through Bloom. So just click on that and then you can see our article. Uh, and then, um, of course, we'd love to, to introduce you to Bloom service. And of course, you can go just go directly to Bloom if you want as well. And that's B-L-O-O-O-M.com. So Chris, I, I want to thank you so much. Um, I, there's a lot more that we could chat about and, and have you on yet again, just because I, I think this is such an important issue. We're talking about the, the thing that we plan for our whole lives and, um, you know, really just some simple applications, uh, having Bloom to kind of oversee what's going on, I think, and really make sure that we enjoy uh, that retirement so much more. 
Well, Josh, if I can, if I can maybe leave your listeners with something, it's a little, it's a little bit, um, not, it's not necessarily related to Bloom. This is just more financial advice in general. I mean, who I am at my core is a financial advisor. You know, I happen to be a co-founder and, and started in an entrepreneur and started this company, but, but who I am at my core and what I am so passionate about is giving advice, like helping people make good decisions with money. And so I think your audience would love to hear what I'm about to say. So before Bloom, these, these clients that I, I shared the story about that oftentimes had, you know, a million plus dollars, um, had that they had accumulated by the time that they were retired. Let me tell you a little characteristic about these people, because I think this probably resonates and and parallels a lot with your listeners right now. So let me tell you these clients that we were working with, what how they did not accumulate that kind of money. Almost none of our clients were super, super high income earners. Number one, we're not. Number two, very, very few of them were business owners that sold a business for a bunch of money. Very, very few. None of them inherited this money. Almost none of them won the lottery. We did have one client that won the lottery, actually. So let me, let me repeat that again. These people that reached retirement with you know seven-figure account balances did not do it because they made a huge income throughout their life, did not accumulate that money because they sold a business for a bunch of money, did not accumulate that money because they inherited it, and did not accumulate that money because they won the lottery. So how did they get those kind of funds in their accounts? The common thread that you can weave through all of those clients that I work with that had those kind of account balances, the one common trait is they spent less than they made. End of story. Period. That it's no more, no more difficult than that. They may have never had even a, a service, a financial advisor along the way. But all that, they, all that they did was whatever their income was, they found a way to spend less than they made. And that difference was socked away. There's no, it doesn't need to be so much more complex than that. It really doesn't. And that, that I think, probably resonates with the people listening to this, that are listening to your podcast um, and the, the, the way that they're living their life. So I wanted to say that to give them some hope that I saw firsthand that when you live your life that way, you can get to that point. And I'm not trying to, to steal a line from Dave Ramsey, but Dave Ramsey's right when he talks about live like nobody else today so you can live like nobody else down the road. That is 100% accurate. The people that are delaying gratification today, that aren't buying the new cars, that aren't extending themselves on big houses, that aren't racking up credit card debts, they're finding a way to travel cheap, they're finding a way to save money on groceries. Those are the people that ended up in my office at retirement we used to joke, we never saw any Mercedes in our parking lots, never saw any BMWs, never saw any fancy cars. It was a lot of 15-year-old cars, um, saw a lot of rubber plastic watches on people's wrists. Those were the qualities of people that, that got to a point in their lives where they found true financial independence. And they didn't have to be whiz-bang investors, didn't have to sell a business, didn't have to make a ton of money. Uh, and didn't have to inherit it either. So um, I wanted to wanted to leave you guys with that. That's wonderful. Chris, thank you so much for sharing that. Chris Costello, you are the founder, one of the founders of, of Bloom with three O's. Thank you so much for the good work that you're doing. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing on behalf of consumers uh, in, in providing clarity and, and helping people be able to uh, re retire on time, be able to retire with more. Uh, it's an important work. And, and thank you so much, Chris. Happy to do it. Now, I'd like to thank Chris Costello from Bloom.com with three O's, of course. And uh, also, uh, you should know that we have an affiliate relationship together. So if you happen to click on our link, obviously there would be some benefit. An angel would get their wings. We'd be able to, it, it helps support the work that we do. Uh, but of course, I really just want you to go get that free analysis uh, so that you can see where you can save more money and keep more for yourself. 
Now, finally, on today's show, we'll learn how we can live more abundantly with the peace of mind that comes from insurance. And with that, I've got Rich Lunsford from USAA to join us. All right, and with us is Rich Lunsford, who's an advice director with USAA. Rich, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you very much for inviting me, Josh. I appreciate it. My pleasure. As we are adulting through life, obviously, you know, one thing that is a major component of uh, managing a family and and kind of managing our life are insurances. They're they're just something that are a requirement, and and there are multiple areas in which we would want to make sure that we are adequately covered. And of course, um, there are health insurances, uh, auto, life, and then home. But home is actually part of a broader category, and. That's where you come in, <laughs> because if there's anybody on the planet that I know uh, understands this topic, that's you, and that's the topic of property and casualty. Can you kind of define what PNC, property and casualty insurances, includes, and 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 what it uh, kind of what it means? Absolutely. So think about um, the easiest way I can put that, Josh, is think about all of your stuff, be that in your home, in your car on your property, those things that you have worked hard to either purchase or have been gifted to you that you would like to protect, okay? So think about it as your stuff. And then there is the casualty side of the thing that is looking at, okay, how do I protect those things in the event of an accident, uh, in the event of a, a hurricane or a major storm or any of those types of things? And then how do I get back whole after these things have been damaged. In essence, from a financial planning perspective, the property and casualty side of the house protects me from having to take loans to replace my car or any of those types of things. It just automatically happens due to the insurance. Same thing with your home. So that's the one piece that most people understand about the property and casualty side. But there's a second piece that is really just protecting your future ability to succeed in those other financial goals in life, right? So if you did damage to somebody else's property from an accident or something like that, then there is a section in here called liability insurance Mm -hmm. that would pay for damage to other people's things. So, and that keeps you, again, safe and being able to take care of those financial goals that you and your family have for the future. You pull those two things together and we really do have that property and casualty play for your financial planning uh, future. I get it. I get it. Yeah. So under PNC, so what areas would would that include that? I I know you say stuff, but if you could kind of maybe just kind of jog through uh, (laughs) everything that might be included and under that umbrella of stuff. Sure. Typically, if you think of anything in your vehicle or your automobile, so that's where you would typically find your auto insurance. Then we look at your home or renter's insurance. So it would protect the items that you have in your home and also your home itself from any damage that you could possibly happen. And then folks that have a boat or a personal watercraft or, you know, those types of things. So any of those items that you own, that's where you're going to be able to protect them with property and casualty insurance. You know, I guess the question I, that, that a lot of people have is like, so for example, if I'm buying electronics from like, I, I just, uh, my son had been saving up and did a bunch of work and he was finally able to afford a Nintendo Switch. And of course, they offer you an extended warranty program. And a lot of times, maybe extended warranties aren't necessarily worth the investment. So I think a lot of us in our minds are thinking, hmm, what things do I really need to insure? And what things, eh, you know, they're kind of optional, or maybe I don't need to insure them. Like, how do you determine what gets insured and what doesn't? Oh, excellent question, Josh. Um, It it is a little bit of a difficult decision these days, right? Because we hear things about, well, every large dollar item you purchase, you need to have a warranty on. Anything that um, you really, really care about, you need to insure. So which is which and what? how do warranties interact with insurance protection? So think of a warranty as being able to replace an item that just 
quit working for whatever reason, right? It is from the manufacturer's defect or what have you. So the manufacturer says, yeah, the product that we put out there didn't really perform the way we wanted it to, and we're going to either replace it or fix it on, on, on our dime because you purchased this particular product. That's a perfect place for a warranty. However, if that same object is you know, damaged in a flood or something along those lines, your warranty might say, well, we don't cover flood. That's where your insurance comes in. Mm. It's extremely confusing. So think about it in the most simplistic way that I've found to explain to, to people is that if it happened by an accident, typically that's where you're going to find your insurance would, would take, take precedence there. If it happened because of a defect in manufacturing or an overuse issue or something along those lines, typically that's where your warranties would actually take care of those things. If I have uh, property and casual, so for, for uh, insurances that I have for the stuff in my home, and let's say that my son sets his Nintendo Switch on a shelf and then he knocks it over, is mm-hmm. there any service that's going to cover that? Possibly. Think about if it is an accident, typically your insurance would cover that. But oh. keep in mind that your insurance has a deductible. And that deductible is a little bit of a, a, the first dollar of any accident is usually taken care of out of your pocket as the person purchasing the insurance. So you get to choose, do you want a high deductible or a low deductible when you take out your insurance policy? So I can't tell you I'm familiar with how much a Nintendo Switch actually costs these days. But if your deductible was perhaps $500, then you might be expected to pay the first $500 of that damaged product for whatever reason. And then anything above that amount, the insurance company would likely take care of that for you, right? Come back to that, an inverse is true for the warranty information that if it is covered under your warranty, the first dollar for the repair or replacement comes directly from the warranty. There is usually not a deductible too much involved. Occasionally on cell phones and things like that, you'll see maybe a $100 deductible for a replacement of a phone or things along those lines. But it is very difficult for most people just to say, hey, what's the difference? Do I need a warranty or do I need insurance? Typically, for something like the Nintendo Switch, you're generally not going to make that claim on your homeowner's insurance, for instance, because typically your deductible is usually higher than the value of that particular piece of electronics. Is it generally total deductible for the year or is it per incident? It is per incident. You know, Rich, I guess my question is, all of my years of of being an adult and there's been a lot. <laughs> There's been many. Um, you know, I don't think I have ever made a claim on my homeowner's policy. Right. And, and I wonder if there's things throughout the years that I just didn't consider that would actually, you know, if it uh, exceeded the per incident deductible, I probably mm-hmm. should have. And it depends upon, and if you look at your insurance policy for your homeowner's policy, on one of the pages, it will tell you what is covered for that particular policy. And it's usually called a peril. Or, and they'll say, these are the perils that this particular policy covers. If you know it is, for instance, a water damage or water seepage or fire or theft, And it will tell you exactly right there what types of perils your particular policy covers, right? So if there was one in there of saying, hey, let's say your Nintendo um, was stolen from your home. Well, typically that would be covered under the theft peril of that particular policy, subject to that particular deductible. Uh Aha. So Mm -hmm. uh, how, let me ask you this. Um, it, life obviously changes. We acquire different stuff. We maybe let go of stuff. How often should somebody be uh, taking a look at their policy? And and you know, are are we auditing? I mean, what what is best practices if you have property casualty insurance? 
Yeah, we want to make sure that you review that policy at least annually. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean to say you can't look in it on other times when life changes. So, for instance, if you uh, either add additional items to your household, let's say you add another room to your home, you have an upgrade or a remodel on your home, that's a perfect opportunity to go back and look at the actual coverages that you have on your homeowner's policy as well. Because in that new room, guess what? You'll probably add more stuff, right? So we want to make sure that your entire home is covered for the amount of items that you do have in it, and you're covered for the right perils that you might be subject to in that particular area as well. Hmm. And and when you're looking at your your coverage amount, is it better to est like I don't know if you want to estimate right on the dot? Do you want to estimate low? Do you want to estimate high? Mm-hmm. Like, again, what would you recommend as if you were a consumer, where would you try to hit that? Another common um, misconception that we hear um, in the property and casual industry is, well, my home is worth this amount. So I should insure it for this amount, whatever that amount is, right? Look on your, whatever I could sell my house for or whatever I bought it for. That's the amount I, I should insure it for. Technically, I would rather see you insure it for what it would cost to replace it. So assume that there's a fire in your home, and you and I both know how much, and especially in certain areas of the United States, the value of your home can fluctuate wildly in many areas. So I'm less concerned with the how much it costs to buy it or sell it, and I'm much more concerned with how much it might cost to rebuild it if I needed to in the case of a fire or something like that. So in those areas, there are various calculations. And typically, when you look for homeowner's insurance in this case, we'll have a calculation for you on what we believe the rebuilding cost for that property would be based upon contractors, cost of lumber, cost of raw materials in your area, so that you're always covered for the replacement cost, not just what the home is actually worth from a real estate perspective. Is the replacement cost more or less usually? Could be either. Like for instance, uh, typically real estate in California is fairly high priced, right? However, the cost to rebuild that home might either be relatively similar or based upon the cost of raw materials this year could be less, right? Or possibly if we're running into a shortage of raw materials, the rebuild cost could actually be more. So that's the other reason we really, really want you to look at this on an annual basis so that we can make sure to monitor that particular value for you throughout the years that you're going to live in that home. So take into account too, that that's also where the professionalism of your insurance company comes in because we are going to assist you or oftentimes do it for you to determine what that true replacement cost should be. Fascinating. <laughs> I, you know, I always, I wonder, so, um, you know, it's, it's always like, you know, when I'm, they're asking me the questions and I'm like, huh, I wonder if I really need that much, <laughs> need myself some money here. Uh, and it's true. And, and unfortunately it, it is, think about your home, especially since we're on the homeowner subject. Um, that's likely the largest investment most of us will ever make. So should something ever happen to it, not only do we need to replace it, but there's also other parts of that particular policy that are going to allow you a place to live while we're rebuilding. it. So it's called a loss of use area. So that's another side of that policy that typically goes unnoticed when you're just looking through and you're saying, hey, I've got to have this insurance to close on my house, right? These are the things that we look like at from a financial perspective. Yeah, we look out ahead and say, what could possibly derail you from financial success in the future? Mm-hmm. And let's put some safeguards in place so that that doesn't really derail your future if you're unfortunate enough to have to go through a loss or something like that. What would you say in terms of like under the property and casualty category, what would you see in like in your, in your experience, have you seen people not covering, but they probably should be covering? 
Yeah, typically the the biggest one that we see, and especially during uh, large storms or hurricanes or things along those lines, is most people will look at their homeowner's policy and believe that they have flood coverage. Unfortunately, that is one of the perils, to use that word again, that is typically excluded from that oh, yeah. particular policy. So that's another policy that we want to see you make sure of. Again, that's the reason for that annual review. If you happen to be you know, in an area that is prone to flood or something along those lines. Yeah. And are, are there other things uh, that, that you might consider either riders or separate policies for like just stuff that you might have in your life? Sure. Anything along the lines of cell phones, uh, the things like, um, you know, those, those higher ticket items. Mm. Uh, oftentimes, let's say that you have in your home some heirloom type of jewelry or some other high dollar items. Typically, those things might have a cap on them on your normal homeowner's policy that you might want to review and say, hey, grandma's diamond ring might be worth a little bit more than the normal policy allows. So I want to make sure that I cover that with something called valuable personal property insurance, both if we're ever damaged. And that's typically what we do. When when I'll do an insurance review with some folks, I'll say, all right, let's get the basics and that's your home, and that's your auto, and that might be something called an umbrella policy that we might talk about in the future, but then we're going to go through and say, all right, these are your basic coverages for your homeowner's policy, and guess what? The grandma's ring might be a little bit more than this particular policy allows for any one individual item, so we want to go ahead and cover that, that gap with something called valuable personal property. You know, when people come to you, Rich, and they're like, man, I I mean, I get insurance, but I don't like spending money. (laughs) Like, uh, how do we, you know, it's like, how do you balance the the desire to be a responsible adult and, you know, kind of playing the odds versus like, man, you know, do I really get like a separate policy for this? Do I really include Mm -hmm. that and and have to pay more in my insurances? It's like, I I guess I'm always trying to find that balance, right? Of like, do I I have to spend money on that or can I get away with that? Uh, Like, what's your logic behind uh, that argument? My logic, there's a certain area that I would consider adequate coverage, right? We had talked about the replacement cost of your home and things along those lines. There's a minimum limit that I think that you just have to be that responsible adult, right? And then there is another level that says, well, I can be, I can lay my head on the pillow at night a little bit more comfortably if I have a little bit more coverage and protect myself from those accidents. But how much will that extra coverage take away from that future goal, let's say, of retirement or paying down debts or those types of other financial goals. To your point, it is a delicate balance, and that is what financial planning really is. Mm -hmm. It's making those trade-off decisions between, I need to protect today and safeguard my ability to grow for tomorrow um, and do all those different things. So if, uh, you know, if we were all in a situation where money was no object, it would be really easy and financial planning would be so very simple. But guess what? Every single dollar that you have is forcing you to make a choice on its best value and use. So where we look at it, there's a certain minimum level that we say, hey, this is you're taking a huge risk of an accident derailing your today's and tomorrow's if you go below this number in coverage. The opposite is true. Hey, I want to be, I never want you to be so overly protected that you'll never be able to pay off any debts or retire when you want to and things along those lines. And that's why we have to take more of a holistic approach to looking at these issues. It can't be just your auto policy or just your homeowner's policy. We start looking at these things in concert of your financial health. And that's where we get to make the best value decisions. Mm. You know, and really what we're talking about is, you know, the very real risk is that 
if you end up losing something that's extremely valuable to you, either through theft or damage or accident or something like that, that that now becomes a, a very significant life issue. And so mm-hmm. that's essentially what we're we're betting against that. Like we we want to make sure because it's when people declare bankruptcy, generally it's because of a life event um, that that really derails them and they can never fully catch up because of that life event. And if you're properly covered, then you've reduced the risk of that life event happening to your family. And you can do things like stay in your home and keep paying your bills and, you know, be um, impacted in a way that really throws you out into left field uh, as, as a family uh, or again, as an adult. I mean, that's, that's really why we have these insurances. Yeah. And and those are the things that we really want to look at that, if it is a, for instance, th- there are some folks who say, you know what, if I, if I lose an iPhone or something like that, I can replace that and I don't need to pay the premium for the insurance, right? I've heard that quite a bit. And to be honest with you, if you, can, if you have savings in an emergency fund, which I also recommend, that if you have that ability, then there's no need to pay that premium on a monthly or annual basis to protect something that you can already protect on your own, right? However, those high dollar items that would really set you back for your, for your future, um, those are items that I definitely want you to have covered and transfer that risk of loss away from you and your family and put it over on that insurance company to write that check for repair or replacement later on down the road. Yeah. That is the best use and the value of that dollar for you to transfer that to the insurance company and maybe take the small stuff for yourself and save the premium on the small stuff, but make sure you're covered on the big stuff. Well, Rich, I know why they call you an advice director with USA. <laughs> you got a lot of good advice. <laughs> well, good. Apparently I'm doing it right. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of like, so I, I feel like I, I want to leave everyone with an action item. And, and mm-hmm. if there was one action item that we could give from our conversation, what would you imagine that action item should be? Yeah, I, I would really look at the at making sure that you start reviewing your property and casualty coverages as one overall unit. They are intended to work together. Uh, And typically we see people worry about their auto insurance and then they'll worry about their renters or their homeowners insurance. And then they'll worry about the other types of coverages. They're really designed to work together. And when you do that, you start finding that we can now plan for other things in your financial future as well. So Mm -hmm. looking at those things often or at least annually, and then looking at them in conjunction with each other, not just as distinctly separate types of policies. I love it. And Rich, I love, love, love my USAA membership and all of the lines of service that I use through USA. Are there any advantages to uh, property and casualty insurance through USA versus um, any other company? <laughs> Well, I, I can tell you, I'm not familiar with every other company, obviously, but I will tell you that um, the USAA membership is special. Um, it is something earned, and it is it is highly cherished. And I can tell you that the folks who work for USAA have indeed a very high mission, and that is to facilitate financial security for our membership. Uh, and that is something that we do not take lightly. It is something that when you come into this membership, you are part of the family. And when we look at various different types of products, the more those insurance policies start working together, guess what? The more often you'll find discounts on each one of those. Mm -hmm. So those autos and the homes, if you start combining them together with USAA, you'll find discounts um, that will assist you then in planning for those other goals or protecting other things that you need protecting as well. I love it. Rich Lunsford, mm-hmm. Vice Director hey. with USAA. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Josh. It was my pleasure, sir. Once again, I'd like to thank Rich Lunsford of USAA for joining us and 
Disclaimer time. USAA is a partner of Savings Angel. We've been working with USAA for a long time as a military veteran myself. I love the work that they do to support military families. I love the work that they do to support uh, families of those who have served. And I'm just so honored to be able to work with them. Now, if you've loved hearing everything on this podcast, would you take a minute and leave a five-star review on iTunes? And actually, it's no longer called iTunes. It's the Apple Podcast Store, Apple Podcast app. When you do that, you help us get this podcast out to more people. The higher our rating, the more we're noticed. I can't do this without you. And our mission here is to help spread this message of abundance, helping you to be wise, more wise with your money, helping you find easy, easy savings. And if you have any specific questions or there's something you'd like to hear me talk about, pretty much a lot of our stuff, like I would say all of it, I mean, it's a lot of our stuff, is all based on questions that we get on our podcast feedback, uh, our Facebook, it, within our Facebook group, or you can call our podcast hotline. That number is 407-205-9250. Leave me a message. And if you do that, I'm going to answer your question, write you back, or with your permission, I might even share your question or story with others on this show. With that, have a wonderful week full of saving more, earning more, and living more abundantly. And thank you for listening. So 209 in the can. I love what I do.